Karate friends, welcome to Classics and Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today, in honor of this spooky month, we're going to be taking a look at some creepy crawlies from the ancient world, some spiders, some scorpions, and we're going to be looking at some myths or urban legends, if you will, that ancient Romans and Greeks had about these critters that are strange and quite terrifying. If you want to learn more about this topic after this video, I would recommend a book called Insects and Other Invertebrates in Classical Antiquity. It's by Ian Beavis. Great read. Pretty much all of my information for this video comes from that book, but there was plenty more information there that I am not going to touch on, so by all means, check that out. Let's start off with scorpions. Ancient people had all kinds of weird beliefs about these critters, starting from the very beginning with their birth or creation. So like many small creatures like worms and mice, most people in the ancient world believed that scorpions spontaneously generated. That means that they didn't think that scorpions bred and had young. They think that they just spontaneously generated from the earth or from rotting material. So scorpions in particular, most people thought that they generated from dead crabs, dead alligators, from rotting wood. And in some cases, you'll even see people say that they are generated from the corpses of humans. So already you can see that their origins are just kind of unsettling and icky. And it really only gets darker from there. So they don't think that scorpions sting humans occasionally on accident from a survival instinct. No, scorpions, according to them, are inherently malicious. They hate human beings and they love hurting them and killing them. They just get a real kick out of it. Many people believe that scorpions ate dirt of all things. So they were certainly not hunting humans, trying to eat them or protect themselves or anything like that. They just love being a pain in everyone's butt. And the only possible good that can come from a scorpion is that apparently if you are stung by a scorpion and you survive, then ever after you will be immune to things like bee stings and wasp stings, etc. And I think everyone agrees that scorpions are rather unpleasant and frightening, but the ancient Greeks and Romans had a strange habit of inventing stories of these scorpions that were basically on steroids. They were souped up, they were giant, they could fly, they had these crazy powers, and they would make these terrifying scorpions inhabit basically the fringes of the known world. So places like Libya and India, places that they heard of, they vaguely knew existed, but they didn't really know much about, they would tell these tall tales about these crazy scorpions. So let's take a look at some examples of these tales. This first one comes from Alien. He wrote a whole book about animals and he has a particular passage about these terrifying scorpions where he says, Megasthenes states that in India there are winged scorpions, winged scorpions of immense size and that they give a sting somewhat like the scorpions of Europe. He also says that there are snakes there with wings, snakes, and that their visitations occur not during the daytime, but by night, and that they emit urine, which at once produces a festering wound on anybody on which it may happen to drop. This next one comes from Pliny's Natural History, and he tells a very strange story about some scorpions that doesn't quite seem like they have wings. It seems like maybe they're doing some sort of flying squirrel technique, but let's take a look at what he says. This curse of Africa is actually given the locality of scorpions. Power of flight by a south wind which supports their arms when they spread them out like oars. Polydorus, before mentioned, definitely states that some possess wings. This next one comes from Aelian again, and it is absolute nightmare fuel. Scorpions. The people of Libya, dreading their numbers and their machinations, devise endless schemes to counter them. They wear high boots, they sleep in beds raised high above the ground, setting their bed cords away from the walls. They place the feet of their beds in vessels full of water and imagine that they will thereafter sleep without fear and in peace. 
But what tricks do scorpions devise? If a scorpion can find some spot in the roof to which he can hang, he clings to it firmly with his claws and lets down his sting. Then a second descends from the roof, crawls down over the first, and with his claws holds fast to his sting and lets his own dangle in the air. A third holds on to that, and a fourth onto the third, and a fifth in a line, while those that follow crawl down over the preceding ones. Then the last scorpion strikes the sleeper, crawls up again over the one above, after him the next, then the third from the bottom, and then the rest, until the entire lot are disconnected, just as if they had undone a chain. <laughs> that is that's horrible. Um, again, you see these scorpions, they're real clever little bastards, and they'll all work together and build this complicated thing just to sting one human, and again, not for any reason, just for the heck of it. Let's move on to spiders. Ancient Romans and Greeks had a slightly different relationship with spiders than they do to scorpions. They definitely think that they're fierce little buggers, but they also appreciate some positive qualities that they think spiders have. For example, the weaving. They think that's pretty cool. They consider spiders clever and industrious, and they also occasionally use the spider webs. So they'll use them in things like first aid. They'll get like a little handful of them and use them as a sort of bandage. So it's definitely more of a mixed bag. Let's take a look at a passage from Pliny where he describes a whole bunch of characteristics and myths about spiders. Spiders actually hunt young frogs and lizards, first wrapping up their mouth with a web and then finally gripping both lips with their jaws, giving a show worthy of the amphitheater when it comes off. Also, auguries obtained from the spider. For instance, when the rivers are going to rise, they raise their webs higher. Also, they weave their web in fine weather and reweave it in cloudy weather, and consequently a number of spiders' webs is a sign of rain. People think that it is the female that weaves and the male that hunts, and that thus the married pair do equal shares of service. So there's a lot more anthropomorphization, for one thing, um, about spiders than there is about scorpions, for sure. We picture them fighting in an amphitheater, and we're proud of them because they're such tough, skilled little warriors. We imagine that they live in happily married couples where the wife stays home and sews and the husband goes off and hunts, which is very silly, but you can see there's sort of an affection, I guess, behind that idea. And last thing we're going to do in this video is take a look at another passage from Pliny where he describes a battle between a spider and a snake. So before you watch any further, real quick, put your bets in the comments below. A spider swings by a thread onto the head of a snake stretched out beneath the shade of its tree and nips its brain with its jaws so violently that it at once gives a hiss and whirls giddily around, but cannot even break the thread by which the spider hangs, much less get away, and there is no end to it before its death. Thanks so much for checking out this video. Again, if you want to learn more, check out that book I recommended at the beginning of the video. There is lots more there. And special thank you, as always, to subscribers and to Patreon members. And I hope to see all of you again next week. Karate.